the vestibular system, vertigo, and dizziness. This is the second part which relates to what is important to you, which is the clinical part. Basic science is very important, it's nice to know, but it does not apply in the clinic. What we are all interested in as clinicians are the clinical picture, what the patient will present with, how are we going to diagnose them, and how are we going to treat them, because the patient aim essentially to be treated, definitely to be diagnosed, but they are interested in being treated. And this is the aim of this second module. There are so many common scenarios in the vestibular system, and if you look into any textbook, there are more than 100 cases of causes of vertigo in patients. But no, not all of these are common. Some are extremely rare, you shouldn't even know their names, and some are extremely common and these common scenarios are the scenarios you are going to face all as clinicians, whatever your specialty, be it family doctors, general practitioners, neurologists, internal medicine, pediatricians, you are all going to face these patients. That is why these common scenarios will be presented to you in a way so that you can diagnose them very easily, very rapidly, just by history taking and with minimal examination, and if you suspect something else, you should refer them to ENT specialist or a vestibular uh, specialist as well. These are the commonest diagnoses you are going to face in your day-to-day -day practice, which are Meniere's disease, migraine equivalent, vestibular neuritis, press biastasia, and BPPV. We are going to see what's this mysterious BPPV. So, usually, like we said, patients did not study medicine, even doctors who are not versed into the vestibular system and vertigo, and so the patients will come complaining in their own language, like you have all already learned that you should hear the patient explaining his or her symptoms in their own expressions. Do not lead them until you have heard their full story. This first scenario is a lady, 35 years old, and I got to get a lot of money from the day, قلبي كان بيدق بسرعة ولوني أبيض زي البتة كنت بهتانة خالص والناس كانت خايفة عليا كنتش قادرة أتحرك وبعرق جامد جدا ودني الشمال كانت مكتومة فيها صفارة عالية والصوت العالي بيزعجني جدا حاسة إن ودنها مسدودة مش سامعة بيها كويس فيها كتمة كأن فيها قطمة وفي نفس الوقت أي صوت بيضايقها زيادة عن اللزوم حاولت تقوم من السرير ووقعت ولكن ما كانش غايبة عن الوعي حاسة بالدنيا بس مش قادرة أتحرك الدنيا بتلف جامد عندها ميل رقيق وغمامان نفس ومش قادرة تتحرك قلبها بيدق جامد وأطرافها ساعة منزعجة جدا موضوع ده قعد أربع خمس أيام وفجأة وراح تدريجيا حتى من غير علاج وبقت كويس المشكلة العيانة جاية لأنها خايفة لأن القصة دي اتكررت معها قبل كده جات لها مرة ممكن جات لها من شهر من اتنين من سنة من خمس سنين بس الموضوع عنيف لدرجة أنها مش قادرة تنساه وخايفة إن الموضوع يتكرر this is the patient's complaint. When you look into the textbooks, we can translate these complaints into more scientific terms. There are the kind of attacks of severe vertigo. She had a previous attack, maybe two, three, four, five attacks of severe vertigo, accompanied by loss of postural control, autonomic symptoms. She had severe nausea and vomiting, tachycardia, hypotension, and cold extremities. And she had some hearing loss, some tinnitus, sense of block, and loud sounds did irritate her, what we call phonophobia. And she had a sense of pressure in the ear. So all these symptoms together can be translated into scientific terms. And these, this complex of symptoms for us will lead to a certain diagnosis, which we call endolymphatic hydrops or Meniere's-like disease or Meniere's disease. This disease is one of the prime vestibular system, and it's usually characterized by the current attacks of a tetrad of four symptoms, hearing loss, tinnitus, vertigo, and a sense of ear fullness. And this is what the patient told us. It is a little bit commoner in uh, ladies, that is why my case presentation was about a lady, but it can happen to uh, men as well. But it is commoner in ladies. Hearing loss is usually mild to start with, but with each recurrent attack, hearing loss becomes much and much more severe. 
Usually at start, it is reversible. The patient senses that hearing is a little bit lower. And then with recovery of the vertigo, recovery of the tinnitus, hearing becomes normal again. But with each attack, damage occurs to the inner ear and hearing loss becomes irreversible. So a long time, the patient may lose his or her hearing over the current attacks. That is why we should treat these patients, we should diagnose them so that we can, uh, we should try to prevent this hearing loss. With each attack, there is a sequence of events which happens, and this is more or less pathognomonic of this disorder. First of all, the patient will sense that the ear is becoming blocked. There is something, they don't complain of really of hearing loss, but a sense of block in the ear, followed by a severe sense of tinnitus. They feel a very sharp whistling sound in their, in their ear, and this is followed by the attack of vertigo. And usually this vertigo is very severe, rotatory, spinning sensation with nausea and vomiting, and some of the patients may even fall down because the attack is so, so sudden and uh, surprising to them, they are not prepared to them. But with each attack, the patient starts to learn that the attack is going to happen. It starts with this sense of pressure in the ear, and now the patient knows, yes, I am going to have this attack, I am going to have this crisis. The ear is blocked, tinnitus starts, tinnitus increases, and then the attack of vertigo occurs. This can happen weekly, monthly, every year, every four or five years. But once the patient had this attack, she knows that she's going to have the attack as well. Usually, even if the patient does not receive any treatment, this attack will abate, symptoms will recover, and the patient becomes completely normal in between attacks. However, with recurrent attacks, the patient may feel that the hearing is becoming less and less and less. And over time, when the patient is not treated, the patient may lose hearing completely in this affected ear. Surprisingly, when the patient loses hearing, she does not have any attacks at all, and she is free of vertiginous attack at a very dear price, which is loss of hearing on this affected ear. So we have to diagnose these patients. These patients will present to your clinic when they are free. Very rarely they present during an attack, so you don't really have overt symptoms or overt signs, but with the history, which such a clear history, you can diagnose these patients. We usually send them to investigate them to know whether this is true or not. And once we are able to diagnose them, they can be uh, treated. This is one actually of the commonest diagnoses you are going to face during your clinical uh, practice. Another common scenario is like this one. Again, this is usually a female. It is usually middle-aged female. Simon to Shafin, Mudira of Shirka Kbira, and Damas Uliyat Kitir. طول الوقت تحت ضغط نفسي وعليها شغل وعاوزه تثبت انها احسن من 100 راجل زي ما كل السيدات العاملات بيقولوا الطبيبات والمهندسات والمديرات عاوزه تثبت انها كويسه فطول الوقت تحت ضغط شغل جامد بيجي لها نوبات دوار متكرره بتحس الدنيا بتلف بيها ساعات بيبقى في مع الدواخان ده ميل لقيء ومره بعديها فعلا جالها القيء وبعدين استريحت كانت دايخة وعندها ميل لقيء وبعدين رجعت وخلاص الدنيا استريحت. ولكن الفرق بينها وبين الست اللي فاتت ما فيش أي ضعف في السمع، مش حاسة إن ودنها مكتومة ولا حاسة بصفارة ولا أي أعراض في الودن اللي كانت تحسها المريضة السابقة. ولكن هنا في نقطة مهمة زي ما أنتم شايفين، الصوت العالي بيضايقها جدا مش مستحملة الصوت، والنور الجامد بيضايقها كمان. غالبا السيدة دي هي هتقول لكم لما بتجي لي النوبه دي هيك بحب اقعد في اوضه ضلمه اقفل عليا ولا حد يكلمني ولا حد يقرب مني واللي هيكلمني نفسي اضربه بالرصاص. في نفس الوقت بيجي لي صداع كتير والصداع ده برضه بيبقى معاه ميل لقيء وغمقان نفس والصوت العالي بيضايقني والنور الجامد بيضايقني. غالبا ببقى حاسه النوبه دي هتجي لي بالذات لو ما بقى مرهقه لما ببقى جعانه لما ببقى مبذول بذل مجهود جامد او بيبقى عندي شد عصبيه جدا ببقى حاسه ان النوبه دي هتجيلي ساعات بيجيلي صداع 
وساعات بيجي لي الدوخه وساعات الاثنين بيجوا مع بعض ولكن دايما الصوت العالي بيضايقني نور جامد بيضايقني. This symptom complex is very characteristic of a certain feature. Usually it's in a young or middle aged very active female, stressed female which has lots of responsibilities. She has recurrent attacks of severe vertigo but no hearing loss, no tinnitus. Most of the time you will elicit a history of headache, usually a pulsating headache or a very sense, sense of fullness of the head, not of the ears. And sometimes we can have some transient neurological phenomena uh, as well. This symptom complex is a migraine equivalent. And this is another a very, very, very common symptom complex, a very common disorder. Not only migraine as a headache, but migraine of the posterior circulation of the vertebral basilar system, which will affect the vestibular system. And mind you, both can occur in the same patient. Sometimes the patient has an attack of headache. Sometimes she or he as well can have an attack of vertigo or spinning sensation. But here, otologic symptoms, the hearing is not lost. On the contrary, it is hyper acute. The patient cannot tolerate loud sounds. He or she cannot tolerate bright lights as well. As you know, in classical migraine, you will have a prodroma, you will have an aura, you have a headache, and you have a postdroma. These are the sequence. You are going to have this in your headache lecture and even in the neurology lectures. But here, this full spectrum is not quite apparent. Usually, the patients may feel that the attack is going to come. They usually complain of this phonophobia, of this photophobia, and of this nausea. And instead of the headache, they have this attack of vertigo. Sometimes we have other symptoms. It's not very important for you. But one of the important things we should ask in the history are the precipitating factors. And as you know, in migraine syndromes, we have some listening factors, especially stress, especially hunger, especially uh, irregularity in the sleep cycle, and some foods as well, which contain tyramine, which will precipitate this attack. And as you know, there are a long list of foods which can elicit uh, migraineous attack at the same time, they can elicit the vertigo as well as they can elicit the headache as well. This is another syndrome which is only diagnosed by history. And so two of the common scenarios are diagnosed only by history. And usually when the patient presents, you don't have any signs and symptoms. And actually, there are no direct investigations to know these two. So proper history taking will give you at least now 30% of all the patients you are going to face. Another common thing, the patient, male or female now, من يومين جات لي دوخة كأني في مرجيحة، دوخة جامدة جدا، بلف كأني في مرجيحة فعلا في الملاهي، كان في ترجيع جامد، كنتش قادر أتحرك، وأي حركة بتزود الدوخة. كان في زغلالة جامدة، وكل شيء كان بيتحرك كأنه فيلم بي... بيتنطط قدامي زي الأفلام السريعة. أنا عامة ما عنديش أي مشاكل، صحتي كويسة جدا ولا ضغط ولا سكر ولا دهون ثلاثية ولا أي حاجة، عمري ما اشتكيت من من أي حاجة، الحاجة الوحيدة يمكن الأسبوع اللي فات كان عندي دور زكام خفيف كده، ما كانش فيه أي مشكلة. This is a sudden onset of severe vestibular symptoms. As you can see, there are no neurological symptoms, there are no hearing problems, and in a patient who is otherwise completely healthy. If you think about anything, which occurs suddenly in medicine, actually you have two broad categories. A vascular accident, a thrombus, an embolism, severe hemorrhage, or a viral infection, which occurs very rapidly, gives severe symptoms, and usually these symptoms are very severe to start with, like a common cold. You have severe symptoms in day one, and then over the coming four or five days, everything settles down, even if you don't have any medication. This is actually what can happen in the vestibular system, and this is the viral vestibular neuritis. And actually, viral vestibular neuritis is a viral infection of the vestibular nerve by itself, usually the vestibular ganglion, but it is, for all practical purposes, it is an inflammation of the vestibular nerve, so we call it vestibular neuritis. It is like a common cold, but 
neurotropic virus, usually herpes virus, which affects the vestibular system. Like a common cold, again, it occurs suddenly with dysfunction of the system, here vestibular dysfunction. So we have severe peripheral vestibular uh, symptoms, spinning vertigo, the head is spinning, I cannot walk, I cannot move, my eyes are moving, so everything around me is moving. I don't have any other symptoms, only this motion induced or this spontaneously occurring movement of the eye and the stagmus, we call it, or the sense of abnormal movement. And usually the patients are really unable to move and any movement will increase their symptoms. The good thing is that it is a self-limiting disorder. It starts very, very strong in the first 24 to 48 hours. And even if we do not treat the patient over the coming week, all symptoms and signs will abate and the patient will become completely normal. This is viral acute vestibular neuritis. Sometimes just a small thing because you are all going to be practicing physicians. Sometimes you have a very clear history, quite suggestive of acute viral vestibular neuritis, but the symptoms do not go away over the past, over the coming four or five days, even a week. In this case, this is what we call pseudo-vestibular neuritis, and this is a danger sign. So when you diagnose your patient with acute vestibular neuritis, you should see your patients after two, four, five days, and at that same time, everything should settle back to normal. If it does not, this is a red flag. This is a danger sign that there is something much more serious going in the background and this is usually a cardiovascular accident. So seemingly, it's a very simple thing. 99% of the time, it is acute vestibular neuritis. It is the viral infection, but in a very small proportion of patients who do not recover spontaneously, totally and completely within the first week, you should think that there is something more serious and you should refer them to a neurologist because this is an indication of a much more serious CNS problem. This is a small parenthesis, but you should be aware of this. Another very common presentation, and eventually each and every one of us will go into that point, me earlier than you, but this is natural course of things. مش عارف ادخل دورة المايه بالليل بحس ان انا هخبط في الحيطه مش قادر اتحكم في حركتي الشهر اللي فات انا وقعت كنت واقف في الحمام بغسل وشي رحت واقع وخبطت راسي و... وتعورت وكمان انا بقى ساعات عاوز افتكر اروح التلاجة اجيب حاجه اشربها بنسى عاوز اعمل ايه اجي امدح على بنتي مش فاكر اسمها الكلام ده بقى له شويه وقت والموضوع عمال يزيد وانا بقى اللي خايف منه فعلا الحقيقه ان انا اقع وقريت في الجورنال انه الناس الكبير لما بتقع الحوض عندها بيكسر وبعد كده ايه ما بيعرفوش يتحركوا خالص وانا فعلا الاسبوع اللي فات وقعت وانا وانا قايم داخل الحمام فانا عاوزك يا دكتور تقول لي ايه الحكايه usually this affects older males because as you know systemic risk factors are much more serious in males but after the menopause males and females are uh, equal here there is no acute vertigo there is no spinning sensation ما فيش دوخة الجامدة والرمامان نفس ولكن أنا مش موزون there is a constant sense of instability loss of motor activity I cannot walk in a straight line I have to have a reference I have to have light all the time I have to have something a reference for me to hold on to walk in a straight line there is persistent instability and at the same time there is loss of locomotion there are other signs and symptoms of central nervous system uh, dysfunction. And sometimes you can have absence attacks. The patient feels that he's just off the grid for, uh, for a short period of time, and then again, he or she regains his activity. These are signs that there is a much wider systemic problem which affects many systems. It affects vision, that affects motion, it affects sensation, it affects the vestibular system, it even affects the higher cognitive functions. And one thing which is common in all these is the blood supply and the oxygen supply, like we said, that these are very critical factors in 
the maintenance of the integrity of the central nervous system and of all the sensory systems as well. These are not severe disorders at, the, at this level, but these are subtle changes which affect the finer movement, the final integration of all these systems. And this is not an acute stroke, it is not an acute obstruction of the blood supply, but it's a chronic, gradual diminution of the blood and oxygen supply to the central nervous system. And in the posterior circulation, in the area affecting the brain stem, we call this vertebral basal insufficiency. This is diminution of the blood supply, diminution of the nutrients going to the central nervous system, to the vestibular nuclei, and to all the integrating systems as well. There are some predisposing factors, as you know, uh, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, loss of autonomic function, loss of autonomic control, and all of these will coordinate together to affect all of the vestibular system, be it the, vis the visual system, the vestibular system, the proprioception, and the motor system. And usually, they are associated with higher cognitive dysfunction, memory disorders, recall disorders, uh, tremors, loss of locomotion. But here, it is important that patients presenting, especially with vestibular dysfunction, they are at a higher risk of a future cardiovascular event. So if you have a patient, an elderly patient with severe risk factors, presenting primarily with autonomic dysfunction, with vestibular dysfunction, with loss of locomotion, with chronic instability, you should take this complaint quite seriously because many of these patients will progress and have much, much more trouble in the central nervous system and they are at a high risk of, act, of getting a disabling or even a fatal stroke. So an elderly patient with good amount of risk factors presenting with chronic instability, what we call press by astasia, loss of stability due to old age, you should take this complaint very seriously, check all the risk factors, try to correct them as much as possible and try to help your patient so they do not get any progression of this disorder as well. Another common scenario, I am 40, 50 سنة. فجأة جاله دوخة جامدة جدا مع ترجيع حس الدنيا بتلف بيه الأوضة بتتشقلب الدولاب كأنه هيقع على دماغي النجفة بترقص كأني جوا زلزال وأنا في الحقيقة كل ما أجي أنام على جنب اليمين بيجي لي الدوخة دي لما برجع على ظهري ببقى كويس باجي على جنب الشمال ما عنديش أي مشكلة بس كل ما أجي على جنب اليمين بحس إن في دوخة الغريب إن أنا كل ما أجيب حاجة من من رف فوقاني في المطبخ بحس ان انا بدوخ برضو وممكن الست تيجي تقول لما باجي انشر الغسيل من البلكونه كاني عاوز اقع وما بقتش اقدر انشر الغسيل خالص. جالي الدور ده قبل كده من ثلاث اربع سنين خدت شويه علاج بقيت كويس او بقيت كويسه اتس ميل اور فيميل ولكن جالي الحكايه دي ثانيه وانا في الحقيقه بقى لي شهرين بالمنظر ده كل ما اجي انام على جنب اليمين مش مستحملة مش قادرة أجيب حاجة من على الرف مش قادر أربط رباط الجزمة في عندي مشكلة خدت أدوية وما خفتش رحت خمس دكاترة وما خفتش كل ما أجي أنام على جنب معين يبقى أحس إن أنا مش قادر So if you can observe that there are certain positions which will elicit this sense of instability or this sense of vertigo it is not a spontaneous vertigo it does not occur by itself but there are Triggers. There are certain things which will provoke this vertigo, which is absent in other positions. And here you can very clearly state, in this patient at least, that being on the right side or getting something from above or looking downwards will elicit this vertigo. So there is a certain position which will elicit this vertigo. And actually, this is the commonest cause of vertigo in clinical practice, which we call benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV. Benign, because it is a benign thing, it's a very simple thing. Paroxysmal, because it occurs in attacks, in paroxysms. Positional, because it is induced by a certain position. A single head position will elicit this type of vertigo. And you have to imagine that the head is in the space. So 
the position of the head in space will elicit right? Usually it occurs when we are sleeping on one side, this is one position, but if we put the head in the same position, even if we are not sleeping, for instance, looking upwards, looking downwards, getting something from the cupboard, or getting something from the ground, you will have this abnormal position which will elicit this vertigo. This vertigo is caused by a very specific thing. If you can recall, when we were looking at the inner ear and the structure of the microstructure of the inner ear, we knew that there are some calcium carbonate crystals which are embedded in a gel over the sensory cells of the utricle and the saccule. Due to some reasons, we are really not sure what are these reasons, some of these particles will displace, will be dislodged from this gel and will go freely in the inner ear fluids, in the fluids of the inner ear, and go settle into one of the semicircular canals. And as you can recall, the semicircular canals are responsible about angular velocity, about head rotation. So if one of these particles go, goes into one of these canals, it will stimulate this canal, even if the head is not rotating. So once we put the head in a certain position, in which this canal, whichever usually it is the posterior canal, which is the commonest and the lowest canal, once one of these particles go into this canal, it will stimulate it. So when I put my head in a certain position, this particle will go into the canal and cause some stimulation of the canal. It will lead to this abnormal sensation of vertigo and moving. So these particles will become displaced settle into an abnormal position and once the canal, usually the posterior canal, which is the commonest, goes into a critical position when it is much lower, by gravity this particle will stimulate the canal and give this sensation of uh, rotation and vertigo and nausea and vomit. But once the head is back in another position, whichever position, the canal will not be stimulated and the patient will not have any vertigo. And as you see, this is a mechanical problem. So any medical treatment usually will not treat this mechanical problem. And as I told you before, in the clinical scenario, the patients may receive lots and lots of treatments and they are not going to be cured because you did not cure the original pathology, which is a mechanical pathology. It is not a pharmacologic pathology. And we are going to see how we are going to treat this very specific, very common disorder. And again, this syndrome can only be diagnosed by clinical history. There are some examinations, but for all practical purposes, by listening carefully to your patient, you will know that there is a single head position in space which will induce this vertigo, and then you can have a suggestion that this is BPPV, and you are going to direct your examination and your treatment in this direction. This is quite nice, but like we said, the patients come primarily to be diagnosed, but more importantly to be treated. The patient will be glad, you tell them, yes, you have Meniere's disease, you have vestibular neuritis, you have BPPV, okay, and then really I don't care what I have. I came to you, doctor, to be treated. So as a doctor, you have the duty to diagnose your patient and a more important duty to treat this patient accordingly, according to your most probable diagnosis. And between brackets, we are never 100% sure of any diagnosis. So you usually work on the most probable diagnosis and that is why whatever your diagnosis, you should follow your patient up. You have to look at your patient again after four, five, weeks to know that you are treating your patient in the right direction. Even if you are sure, you should always tell your patient, please come back, whatever, not only the vestibular system, in any system, you have to ask your patient to come back because sometimes you have things which look alike but which are not the same disease. You have diagnosed most probably this is vestibular neuritis, like we said, but the patient did not follow the normal pathway. 
ah, here this is the red flag. This is not what I diagnose. I have to revise my diagnose. And this is important. And if you do this, less and less patients will be lost to follow up and you ha will have much better record of proper diagnosis and proper management. For the vestibular system, we have two main problems. The acute attack, the patients come extremely vertiginous, severe vertigo, nausea and vomiting. They are unable to move, unable to walk, unable to conduct their normal lives. So we have to treat them, to symptomatically treat them, to treat these symptoms like a patient with a severe headache. I know it can be a brain tumor, it can be a migraine attack, it can be head trauma, but now the patients want to be relieved of his or her symptoms. I want to cut short this vertigo. I want to cut short this severe pain, for instance. So we have treatment of the acute attack. All patients need to be treated now to stop this acute vertigo. And then, at the same time, we are diagnosing our patients. We know that this, for instance, is an acute attack of Meniere's disease. I'm going to treat this acute attack, and then I'm going to treat Meniere's disease. So we have treatment of the acute phase, and then treatment of the established disease. And sometimes the disorder of the vestibular system is chronic. It's a long-term problem. It does not cure itself. It cannot be cured by drugs. But we have a very important feature of the vestibular system because it is such an important life feature that it compensates itself. If I have a problem, a chronic stable problem in one ear, for instance, the vestibular system on one ear is not functioning properly, the CNS and the contralateral ear will take over and will compensate for this loss of function. And over time, the patient can function with a single vestibular system. But we have to help these patients, and this is what we term compensation. So we have to take that tooth attack, we have to treat the established disease. And if we know that we cannot reverse what has happened, we have to enhance compensation. We have to help the patient regain his or her balance by encouraging the central nervous system to rely on other systems and encourage the other ear to take over the function of this lost ear. Of the acute attack is the same whatever your diagnosis, because as I told you, we have to relieve the patient now. The patient will not be happy when you tell him, okay, we are going to give you treatment, and over six weeks you are going to be fine. Really, doctor, I don't care. Now I came to you, I have severe retigo, I have nausea, I have vomiting, I cannot move, I cannot drive my car, I cannot go to my work. I want to be treated now. And this is the patient's right and our duty. Acute vertigo, you have to treat the patient now, even if you know your diagnosis, because all treatments will take time. All specific treatments will take time. So you have to treat your patient now for this acute attack. And as you see, there are lists of drugs which are active in the acute attack. But once you have treated your patient for this attack, you take your patient back in the follow-up after a couple of days and treat him or her with the specific treatment according to your very diagnosis. To treat our patients, we have gradation of treatments. Like anything in medicine, you have graded treatments. You start with phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, depending on the, your diagnosis and depending on the response of the patient to the treatment. For the vestibular system, we can give drugs, medications, uh, pills, injections, whatever. Sometimes you can give intratympanic injections. We can inject drugs directly into the middle ear, and these drugs will diffuse into the inner ear and affect the inner ear functions. Sometimes you can submit the patient to some sort of surgery to relieve the vertigo, and in all cases, we have to enhance compensation, like I told you, and this is the role of rehabilitation of the vestibular system. So whenever you have a patient with a vestibular disorder, you have a wide variety of choices for this patient depending on, depending on the stage of the disease and depending on the response of, of the patient to your treatment and to your primary uh, treatment. Drug treatments are usually 
very specific depending on your diagnosis. And as you can see, once I diagnose or I label my patient as one of these diagnoses, we start this specific treatment for variable periods of time depending on the diagnosis and depending on the natural course of the disease. These are some examples of the common diagnosis and the common treatments usually prescribed for these treatments. And as I told you, you have to follow up your patient to see if the disease is really controlled by your drugs, if you have to change your dosage, if you have to change the drugs, or if you have to revise your diagnosis. Sometimes, even with a proper diagnosis and proper treat medical treatment, the patients do not respond, so we can change to phase two, for instance, if there is available injections, if there is available surgery, and so on and so forth. But in most cases with vestibular disorders, medical treatment in these common disorders is quite effective, provided you give your patient the proper dosages for the proper amount of time, and all the time encourage your patient to move. Simple movement, even simple aerobic exercise, will help compensation even if the patient is in the progressive stage of the disease. So mobility of the patient is here extremely important. The patient is completely distressed by his or her vertigo, by his instability. But if you keep the patients in bed, you limit their mobility. In most of the cases, you are not doing the patient a good service. You should enhance mobility. You should encourage the patient to move, encourage the other ear to compensate, and encourage the vestibular system, the central nervous system, to compensate for all these de deficits and speed the recovery of this patient. Finally, the one thing which does not respond to medical treatments, which is the commonest vestibular disorder, which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And as I told you, this is a mechanical problem and it is treated mechanically. Usually, we try to move these particles which fell into the wrong place. We try to move them out of the canal. And this is what we call a repositioning maneuver. A repositioning maneuver will move these particles out of this abnormal position and put them back where they belong in or dissolve in the uh, fluids of the inner ear. So once you diagnose a patient with benign paroxysmal position vertigo, you should not give him or her any treatment. You should refer them to a specialist who is able to diagnose which canal is affected, and it's a mechanical problem which is solved mechanically by moving the head in different positions in space to displace these uh, small particles out of the abnormal canal, and the patient is really treated on the spot. And most of the time, they will not need any further treatment. So as you have seen, there are very limited amounts, very limited diagnosis, actually, very limit, limited uh, types of diseases you are going to face in your daily activity, in your day-to-day -day life. And if you think about taking a good history, listening to your patients, most of the time you are going to be able to diagnose these patients and even start their treatment in the primary care setting. And then if the patient does not respond, you can then refer them for better treatment, for better diagnosis, or for better uh, investigation. If we did not have our vestibular system, which is working normally and properly, we would not be able even to walk. We would not be able to drive would not be able to go into space, we would not be able to enjoy even a ride in the amusement park, we could not be able to go into space because the vestibular system gives us an awareness of our environment, awareness of our movement, awareness of our directions. And it is our duty as doctors to know how does it work, when it does not work properly, what are the symptoms, what are the probable diagnoses, and how to treat these patients. Thank you very much.